And at the end of the day, someone spotted a horse, maybe it was someone like my daughter who said, gee, there's a pretty pony, and they dragged the Trojan horse in. And so this notion of building a big barrier to defend against the unknown is not native to what we do as humans. It's not productive. Troy was not a productive society for 10 years whilst it was surrounded. Instead, we do something quite different. And certainly in the US, where the Declaration of Independence enshrines some important concepts such as these, unalienable rights, liberty, justice, the pursuit of happiness. These are all call-outs to the Roman civic notion of happiness as being a fulfilled civic duty where we are collaborating and participating as part of a community and delivering value to the society. So it turns out that humans are pretty good at this. Um, we're very, very good at it. And, and indeed, cultures which enshrine these reductions of risk in the culture turn out to be more productive because people are more free and they can collaborate more freely. But it has limitations. And so here's a, here's a sign that I showed to my son. And he uh, is all over. He loves this idea that he can go off and pick an ice cream. So I click on the slide to show you that trust is not a universal thing. Trust is a relative thing. So we as humans actually don't practice this notion or a universal notion. Trust, we practice relative trust. Relative trust is, here's another analogy for relative trust. Uh, you might trust your auto mechanic to fix your car, but you probably don't trust them with your bank account either. And that's relative trust. Contextual notions of trust. And so we've developed this uncanny, accurate ability as humans to divide trustworthiness from all sorts of cues in the physical world. Would my son want to have an ice cream from this truck? The answer is very, very clearly no. But the information is very, very similar. So, just a, a conclusion to this notion of trust, the idea of relative trust, which um, so we're going to transcend to computer terms very shortly, there's a great analogy for it, which is uh, a quote from E.L. Doctorow, and it goes like this, relative trust is like driving a car at night. You can't see beyond the headlights, but you can make the whole journey that way. Okay, that you can trust what you can see, you move forward, and that's how you that's how you live in the world. That's how we as humans are. We live in a world full of relative trust. Whenever we are out in the wild, meeting people, hopping into taxis, dealing with people at conferences, we exhibit relative trust. That is how we have survived for millennia. Trust is the most fundamental survival mechanism that we humans have evolved. Now, the problem with this trust stuff is that it has really fundamental limitations in the electronic world. So, if you're anything like me, you wake up in the morning, and you kick, your, kick the dog, make yourself a cup of tea, and then you go off to Twitter, and I just get, a, I get everything I need from them. So, when we do that, here's my Twitter world, you can see the dot tweet deck, I'm just going to click on the tweet, just to press the URL point. So this is what people, billions of people do, you know, per month and so on. Look, oh, we've got a bit of stuff running. There's a little flash of Java there. Oh, point. Now with some modern tools, I can show you that within the five seconds or so of that Java, this piece of Java code executing, the bad guy completely compromised my machine, reached out to botnets all over the world, modified various bits of state on my device, and otherwise compromised it. And so here is a real challenge. You see, what, what is trustworthy? When you open the attachment to the email, did it come from me? Is the attachment what it claims to be? All of our machinery, which has perfectly evolved for the human uh, in, in a physical world, is absolutely useless when we're online, when we are in a milieu which does not support this notion of our humanity and our need for us to trust. And you have nothing that helps you prime this, this machinery. And so we make mistakes, because we, we as humans make mistakes and that's how we learn. And by the way, having met me, I can guarantee that I can get you to click on something. It's 
So this is a non-trivial problem. That is, the boundary between you know, your being safe in an online scenario and your being completely out by me is nothing more than a handshake. And this is the state of the art. Now, who is the attacker? The attacker was one of my colleagues. He happened to have a bad password. Okay? So the, the problem here is that as we as a culture, as we as a society, have stepped online, we have had profound changes in terms of how we deal with trust. And if you go back to something like the Declaration of Independence, those wonderful words that I put out a little bit earlier, how do you feel about those in the context of Facebook? Who has a Facebook account? Don't bother putting your hands up. Who puts their credit card information in anything to do with Facebook? Great, I like that. See, there's relative the trusted work. And relative trust in this wonderful world of the online milieu gives you this within days of each other. You trusted Instagram for a while, then they suddenly decided that they were going to sell you. And then, oh, no, they changed that policy to turned into something else. Contrast that with the Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights, and the Constitution. These are documents that a society embraced. And now we have Instagram arbitrarily deciding what's important for you. So we have some profound challenges as we step into this online milieu. Let's be honest, we spend our lives on these devices. We love them, they're immersive. But we have none of the machinery that historically has helped us. Ultimately, the problem is this. It's a decidability problem. Okay? When you are online, it is absolutely impossible to decide whether you are surfing with a dolphin or a shark. And worse than that, as a human, you have always wanted to surf with a dolphin. And so when something looks like a dolphin, you grab your surfboard and run. This is the big challenge. So, how do we deal with it? Well, I'm going to give you four reasons why this is a very, very difficult problem. And then I'm going to show you something extraordinarily simple, which is a hint at a solution. But before I go there, what I'd like to encourage you to do, because people like you are leading the research of the next generation of devices, is I would like you to embody this notion of innate security within everything that you do, because it is so vital as we step into this online milieu. So what are the problems here? The problems in terms of this world of security and electronic devices, the problem number one is the use, it's the you and user. In other words, you as a user are gullible and easily okay? You are keen to learn more. You will click on the thing. And by the way, if it looks like an email from your boss, you have no choice. So problem one is the human user. And one way to think about this is, you know, we, the way that we use devices as humans, it's all about me, it's all always about me when I'm using a device. I think of the device in terms of my apps and my stuff, and so we had a great discussion about that this morning. I think of it in terms of multi-tenancy. So if you know anything about cloud computing, you know about multi-tenancy. Multi-tenancy is the ability of a cloud to, to simultaneously run the applications of multiple tenants who have completely different requirements in terms of separation. Well, I can easily convince you that there are at least two tenants of your device. You and, and your boss, perhaps, or you and the CIO or the CISO. It's much worse than that, actually. Every single website that you have ever visited sent a blob of Java or JavaScript or something back, which was run locally on your PC or on your device. It is therefore a tenant of your device. It is a tenant of your device. How good is your device at multi tenancy That's the question of our time. What is the notion of multi-tenancy for the client? <coughs> now, if you go to the enterprise today, they'll say this. I'm going to give you a lousy, dumbed-down user experience with a crappy device, and I'm going to stop using Facebook and Twitter because I cannot trust them. They're kind of right. Because everything that you do with a device could potentially attack the enterprise. But it's not that simple. It's way, way, way harder than that. And IT is getting itself completely wrapped around the wheel and doing the wrong thing, although 
it's trying to do right there. So IT gives you a lousy user experience. What do you do? You drag all this stuff off to Dropbox. Because that's what you want to do. You want to keep productive. Why is this? Why is this boundary between me and work an artificial boundary? Because go and ask the person at RSA Security who clicked on a work attachment to their email and became the bad guy for that corporation. The boundary is you. You, the user, own the boundaries between any of these contexts. Okay? So, you click on the attachment, you're the bad guy, and everything is lost. <laughs> you might think that all of this should have been solved by the security industry. And I'm going to plead with you as reasonable, rational, well-trained academics to utterly reject this nonsense, okay? That is, the language of the security industry is totally bankrupt. Safe is not a religion, it's a right. Safe never sleeps. Good for you. You know, Robocop's going to save your backside when you're in cyberspace. This is utter nonsense. And you know it's nonsense. And yet you buy the stuff. Why? Out of some misplaced hope? I had a meeting with the CISO of NATO, who told me that he is now required to have two of everything, two firewalls, two IPS as well, from different vendors, by the way. So sure, he doubled his cost. I asked him, how much more secure are you? He said, I have no idea. He didn't even know how secure he was when he had one of them. So, the industry has been lying to you, but you guys, are super smart intellectual uh, academics. And you know this to be true. That is, you know the answers. The bad guy's cloud is the biggest on the planet. It's way bigger than anything owned by any organization. Okay? So just take Configure, the cloud called Configure, which includes your mom's PC, it has more than 18 million CPUs in it. It has upload bandwidth of 28 terabits per second. And it's present in 230 countries. And it's for hire. And you can run whatever applications you want on it. There is no doubt of this. There were 400 million unique variants of malware in 2011. And over 1 billion targeted attacks in 2012. It's getting worse. It's getting worse. And there has never been a time in our history where we have been so embrace so to have so wholeheartedly embraced a new technology and be so woefully protected <coughs> as we do. That is, right now we are massively exposed to an intellectual property theft and, and far more. And why do we know that this battle against the bad guy will be lost? We know that we will lose this battle against the bad guy because before the first computer was built, Alan Turing proved it in 1947. It's just a restatement of the whole thing problem. If you want a more modern casting of the problem, this whole notion of detecting the bad guy is done. It is not possible. And you know that because you are a smart academic. So it's time for us to kick these stupid notions of bankrupt ideas to the curb where they belong. And I call on you as rational academics to do so, and to do so in a very declarative way. It is no longer fensible to live by things which we know are mathematically impossible. Okay, so I'm going to now point towards a future which I think can be right. And the reason I, I'm excited about it is because I think that a few very simple additions to the devices and systems that you build can make them inherently secure. The model is going to be relative trust. Relative trust is the model that we as humans have had to guide us through life for millennia. And it has worked pretty well. If you look at the traditional life cycle of a device, particularly in the enterprise, say today, you've got this configuration of patching and so on, in point security software, managing software, data loss prevention, then there's all the adoption of cloud and SaaS and so on. Right in the middle is this huge big hole, which basically says that this is an unsolvable problem. 
So instead of the Trojan model of security, I'm going to invite you to consider another one. Okay, so the model of security at Troy was we'll just build some big walls around the enterprise and we will be robust to the invader. We know that that didn't work. So the model I'm going to encourage you to consider is one built up to Byzantine full tolerance. So if you'll permit the, uh, the analogy here, I'm going to take you on a very, very quick tour of a device view of a Byzantine battlefield. Now, the model here is very different. You and I are Byzantine generals. We're conducting ourselves on the battlefield. And we must win. In order to win, we have to conduct a battle in which we coordinate our activities. Our troops have to work together to beat the enemy. Now, at any point in time, the messengers that carry messages back and forth between us could be working for the other side. They could be killed. Any one of our cohorts could fail at its current task. And yet, this mission must succeed. If you succeed in solving this problem, which is a distributed agreement problem, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, you end up with a system which is known as Byzantine Fault Tolerant. Okay. And I'm going to, if you'll permit me, just a few um, analogies. I'm going to show you how you could map this notion of Byzantine Fault Tolerance into any device that you build. So, the most fundamental thing to notice about this picture is that our general is vulnerable. The device, the software, the, the personality of the device that you're building is vulnerable and must be protected at all costs from everything, from the outside world. <coughs> so if this were my device, basically the software that is on my device at the start of day must be protected from the bad guy. What you would do to build a Byzantine fault tolerant system is you would decouple execution dependencies to maximally independent, maximally independent, distrustful targets. So that if any one of them fails, you'll still be okay. So you might say to one bunch of your soldiers, go beat down the door. Another bunch, go and shoot arrows over the ramparts of that city. But you would never say you, to all your cohorts, go off and do all of your different jobs. Join up on the battlefield at 11 a.m. precisely. Don't like, make a step forward until everybody is there and then charge. You can't do that because if one of those tasks fails, the whole enterprise <coughs> fails. So decoupling into maximally distrustful tasks is a key ingredient for Byzantine fault tolerance. You, the general, would control communication with your troops. If the general is not in charge, the units on the battlefield can arbitrarily make their own plans, and you have no idea as to whether or not your plan is being executed then you may well fail. You would restrict the access to information and resources <coughs> for each task, each cohort, based on what it needs. You would definitely not do this. You would not say to our cohort, hey, go pound down the door. And in case I don't see you later, take a master copy of my battle plan in your back pocket. Okay? Because if somebody takes you up, then they get to the master plan. By the way, all of our devices do this. When, you, when I showed you the Java compromise of my PC, a zero day jumped into the kernel. At that point, the bad guy had everything. That's nothing more than one of my soldiers or one of my cohorts being attacked on the battlefield and being defeated. Okay, We must be able to survive based on this notion. Okay. So the principle of least privilege is absolutely fundamental to any execution path in which there is a lack of trust. And finally, as the general, you would never, ever, ever trust anything from the outside, not messages or anything else. And if you're interested in, in the proof of the Byzantine general's problem, there's a ton of stuff on Wikipedia, you can go and read the original articles. It was proven in 1980. So if you go about building a system which is Byzantine fault tolerant, you have a shot at building something which is defensible in the face of Byzantine failures. Arbitrary, crazy things go wrong, and the system will remain intact. You 
you will remain secure. And so my plea to you is to adopt this notion of reasonable tolerance and relative trust, or perhaps this notion of, uh, of, uh, of least privilege, into everything that you build as a device. The basic notion of a kernel and applications is familiar to all of you. It's on every one of the devices we use. And it's not good enough because if I compromise the kernel from one application, then I get everything. And that is not acceptable as a way to protect the device. So the entire approach that we have taken with rings of trust all built on least privilege in the, in the, in the electronics industry was fine until we started to demand glorious user interfaces and very rich applications. And don't anybody try and convince me that an iPad is anything less than that. Okay. And the moment we did that, we went from just a few system calls and hardware protection to thousands. Okay. And we made ourselves vulnerable to the compromise of the kernel. And if I compromise the kernel, I get the keys to the castle. That's the problem that we have on our world today. So I'm going to show you a system architecture which is based on Byzantine fault tolerance using something known as a least privileged separation kernel. But it's possible to incorporate into every device that we would build from now on. In fact, it's an x86 device, anything in the last three years. And it comes good as virtualization. So I'm going to dive into an architecture that shows you how we can build this notion of least privilege into every device in a way that doesn't change what the user sees or what they expect or the performance that they get, which gives them still a, a joyful user experience and nonetheless makes the system absolutely invulnerable to attack. Okay, so it starts with hardware. And this is why I love this, I love CES and I love hanging out with the IEEE bunch because you're all hardware geeks. Make a hardware that does this, please. It's really simple. So, the technology I'm going to talk about is a thing called a microvisor. Technically, it's just a hypervisor, but we don't talk about VMs in this context. In fact, this is the least privileged separation kernel if you read the security literature. All you need is it's something like Intel VT, but we know that there's hardware virtualization support coming on ARM v7, and therefore, within a very short period of time, it is reasonable to assert that you will have a capability to do this on every device. Okay. And I think it's fundamental not only for client devices, but also for services. So whenever we have this hardware juice for security, we can do some really crazy things. Now, hypervisors were used to build clouds, running virtual machines abstracted from the hardware. And that one level of indirection has proven an extraordinarily useful capability for private companies as well as for cloud providers. But if you use a, a hypervisor in a slightly different way, you can do something which is mind-bendingly cool and results in a system which is Byzantine fault tolerant. And it's very simple. It goes like this. Every time you create a task in the operating system, you hardware isolate it using all of the hardware isolation principles offered by Intel VT or by the OCD. And now, the hardware acceleration piece of this is absolutely vital, okay? Because you can do this in a flash. Virtual machines on servers and so on take you know, minutes or whatever to install. We're not talking about installing an operating system here. What we're talking about is simply running a task using all of the hardware acceleration, hardware page level walking, and all of the juice that's been provided by the hardware vendors. And this can happen if you have the source code, the operating system like Android, you can do this in, in microseconds. If you retrofit it to an existing operating system, such as my device here, which is Windows, or if you did it on Mac OS X, you can do it within about 10 milliseconds, 10 to 20 milliseconds. So, absolutely undetectable by the user, lightweight, fast, you have hundreds of hardware contexts in which to do this. And the goal is to make this completely invisible to the end user. Okay. I'm going to assume something that I think I've said before, but I'm going to say it slightly differently. The end user has no role in determining security. One of the biggest failures of Windows from Vista on was this whole notion of UAC. Has anybody ever clicked anything other than OK to Windows UAC? 
and aren't all Wi-Fi networks your home network because it's much easier to get to that than to work. Okay? You cannot rely on things that will make reasonable decisions without trust. So the user sees none of this, and indeed it should have no effect on management systems. So architecturally, if you built a system architecture, this could apply to a PC or it could apply to any device, an iOS style device, Android or anything else. This hypervisor is technically a least privileged separation kernel. It lives between a trusted and untrusted world. So when you get the device from the, from the vendor, it has some software. Great, we know that that was good when it was put on there. And we can do uh, boot time checks to make sure that it's still in good state. If it's an IT scenario for the enterprise, whatever IT puts on the device. We don't trust it, we know it's wrong. Maybe on So PC, it's 100 billion lines of code. And then this microvisor, this least privileged separation kernel, is going to play an essential role in dealing with trust thereafter. It's going to implement least privilege. So every time you type in a URL or click on a favorite or touch a tweet or click on an ad or click on a document or an attachment or something on a USB file, anything that comes from outside the system, we place it into a separate kind of micro VM, a kind of specially protected task, which is going to have extraordinarily hard boundaries. Extraordinarily hard. I'm going to describe what those are. First of all, well, there are two key, two, two key protection mechanisms at work here. The first one is that we can narrow the resources available to one of these tasks exquisitely according to the principle of least privilege. So, let me make this very, very clear. Um, all resources, let's just put all resources on the far side of the system, all devices, all file system, all, all sharing and keyboard, copy and paste, all these mechanisms, access to the user at the keyboard, all of these live on the trusted side of the system. And in order to access any of those, we have to cross through this least privilege separation code. So let me make it really concrete for you. If you were the browser tab facing Facebook, what files do you need in the file system? You need one file. It's called the cookieforfacebook.com. What network do you need? You need access to the untrustworthy internet and no more. So even if my device is attached to my corporate network, it must never be able to send a packet to anything on my corporate network, any of my trusted sites or any of my cloud or value sites or my bank. It must not be allowed to do that either by resolving a DNS query or, or indeed hand numbering an IP data graph. Okay? If, if I'm looking at, a, at an Adobe PDF document, how many files do I need in the file system? I need one. It's called an Adobe PDF document. And what networks do I need access to? None. Right. Because when a PDF document starts reaching out to Romania, it's generally not a good sign. So this notion of least privilege can be applied in an extraordinarily granular way on a per task basis and if forced by hardware. We describe to you how this happens. Whenever a, a task tries to access a resource that is available to it, it will take a hardware forced VM exit forced by the CPU and it will be unloaded from the CPU. At this point, the microvisor is loaded in and it implements mandatory access control. So it's a least privileged mandatory access based separation kernel. And so you can guarantee that you always, always, always get to check. There is another key principle also just coming straight from hardware, and that is this notion of copy on write. You see, we've given up on the ability of the software folks to detect bad guys. So at some point, some bad guy is going to get into one of these tasks of compromise. As far as the bad guys are concerned, stopping on the operating system's kernel or registry or any of your files in there, the attack has succeeded. But copy on write allows us to ensure that no modifications are ever made outside this hardware bounded box. And the reason this is so important is that we know the detection problem is not solvable. But we can rely on your order. At some point, you will close the task facing Facebook, or the doctor, or something, at which point we simply throw it away. At this point, what I've shown you is an architecture for a device, 
which always remains gold, which is robust even though it has not been patched, and which naturally discards all malware. It's reasonable to ask how much more secure it is. My current estimate, based on lines of code, we have a four to 10,000 line of code uh, vulnerability in a system like this, but that will improve. And also based on the ephemeral nature of these, these tasks, it's, it's something like 100,000 to maybe a million times harder to break a system like this than the device you have in your pocket now. Now, a million times harder is extraordinarily difficult to break. It's post-economic, right? Because at the end of the day, it always comes down to how much will the bad guy invest in order to break in and get the reward of whatever you happen to be having on your device uh, versus the cost of doing it. So think of the, and most of these attacks, the one billion target attacks of last year, they all had a human sitting on the far end of okay? This is a bad guy driving around the side of your PC trying to steal documents or getting deeper into the network. Okay, so take one attacker, and now they need 100,000 attackers. That's post-economic. Okay, it turns out that there's another problem that we can solve with this architecture, which is also kind of handy. And that is that if we really take to heart this notion that we cannot detect the bad guys, and the detection to protect has fundamentally and fatally failed, then we can do something wild, wildly cool. You see, a hypervisor, as the most privileged code in the system, has the opportunity to introspect any task at any level above it, any of the rings above it. And so, you can see every change made by a task like this, no matter what it did, and all of those changes are copy on my kept in the microphone. So for a hypervisor to be able to introspect into one of these little micro -bands is very easy. There's only one task in there. Any change made to the system is specifically and only due to that task. And remember, where a Mac or a semantic or whatever has to try and detect early to stop an attack, we now don't care. We have an architecture that's going to protect us anyway. An architecture where the attacker has to break the CPU to succeed. Okay? So, in that world, in the MACV, semantic detect to protect world, lots of false positives because detection early is an extraordinarily difficult problem because of polymorphism. If you just throw your hands up in horror and say, what the heck, let it go, malware will eventually have to compromise the system, no matter what the system is that you're on. And compromising the system is dead easy to see. Why? One of these micro is executing copy on write. Every piece of it, every change is cached, copy on write, the microbit, and I see when it happens and exactly what is going on. So in a Windows context, that could be the bad guy stopping a registry item or compromising the kernel or whatever it happens to be. It's very easy to see, and you can do it with zero false positives. Now, I'm not saying that it's possible to build a perfect detector because the physicists would tell you that that doesn't happen. But what I can tell you is that you can build a system which has zero false positives for a very, very simple model of the expected behavior of a no brainer task, like something like a web browser or any of these applications that we happen to use on our modern devices. And so we can build interfaces that would allow us to actually get an immediate view into the behavior and the targets of determined attackers coming into the system. So, here's an architecture which basically implements this model of least privilege. It does it using hardware, not software. And this morning was all about how software wins the battle. I'm going to call out to the fundamental need on the part of hardware to be able to support this kind of capability in order for us to build devices that inherently, by design, protect ourselves. And I think it's a fundamental requirement for the future. So, if you embrace security by design in terms of what you're doing, you can protect by design. Okay? I think this notion that consumer devices should protect by design is absolutely crucial. You cannot ask the user to make decisions based on trust or lack of security. 
You can build systems which are robust to user mistakes. We are gullible. We learn by making mistakes. We click on bad stuff. We can secure data at runtime. We can prevent our web from getting into crossing privileged domains and going into our networks. This is the right way to go towards solving the big conversation in the enterprise, which is all about bring your own device. Because if I cannot build a bastion of trust, an unbreakable bastion of trust for the enterprise on a consumer-owned device, the whole game is, is ridiculous. It's about how do you, I mean, that turns every device into a determined insider. Okay? It allows us to fix the perimeter problem, this idea that we have to have a perimeter around the enterprise, which we know is indefensible. Because if every endpoint is absolutely robust in protecting itself, basically, you don't have to worry about all that stuff. It allows us to protect devices independent of whether the software guys have done a good or bad job. And you know that they have bugs. So as hardware people, you should basically build this in. This is a core capability. And it allows us to eliminate remediation. Okay. So just a couple of slides then to put it graphically in a slightly different context. And then I'll be very happy to take some questions. If I postulate a future for us in this online year, there are two ways I can give it to you. We're in this wonderful world, a new, a new fish tank. And the only thing I can do to make you safe is to put you in your own hole. In other words, I'm going to give you a dumbed-down experience. I have to protect you in some way, isolate you from it, keep you at a distance from it. Right? That's one opportunity. The other one is to put every single interaction into its own bubble, which is distrusted and discarded the moment you're done with it. Okay. That's this notion of least privilege, um, relative trust, which we as humans have modeled for millennia, and which has got us this far in our existence. This is a far more satisfying model because you aren't in the bowl anymore. Okay. You get to experience the entire thing and you get to be protected at all times by very simple primitives for relative trust. For me as a, as a parent, it's all about relative trust then for my kids, and I have a, an ongoing experience. But what I have found is that having started to build systems like this, relative trust pervades everything that I do. And as a, as a result, um, I find myself role modeling it for my children. And that's a very interesting discussion, but perhaps more appropriate uh, with a beer after the talk. So I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'd be very happy to take some questions.
do that always, or else I have to have a very simple calculus which says that every time I connect to an untrusted share, everything is untrusted. And then I'm going to put it into this little bucket. And so there's very straightforward calculus which lives behind a system like this. It's, it's very, very good. You can write in the back of a napkin. Um, the hardware isolation mechanisms now that we have VTD, which is the IOM and Bjorn on the x86 architecture, um, allow us to do something very interesting, which is take it one step further. You see, when I talk to people in, the, in various government agencies about bring your own device, they describe it thus. Oh, bring your own device. It's like, uh, oh, I have a guy out in the field in a foreign country, let's just say he's far out in the field in Pakistan. He walks into an internet cafe and needs to get me a message security. That's bring your own device. Are you happy with that as part of what you do in your enterprise? So bring your own device is, is a, as a term, it sounds so great because everybody wants to be walking with a MacBook Air, but in fact it is walking in inside, a determined insider into the enterprise. And so we have to be able to deal with this determined insider problem. And there are real challenges with determined insiders um, who might try and defeat protection mechanisms on the device itself. Once you get VTD, you can do that. You can arbitrarily distrust bits of the system, including bits of hardware and inputs generated by users and other parts of the system. And so with VTD, you can make the whole system robust even to determined insider. And it, I believe is the key to actually taking the final step towards actually making BYO, BYO reasonable. In BYO, you have a completely and it's arbitrarily empowered end user. They have full administered control over the device. And so they will download and install malware, which when it's plugged onto the enterprise network, will attack you. We have to be able to deal with that. And with these hardware protections, TXT and, and uh, essentially BTD, we can, we can get there. This 
designed to lie to you because otherwise it doesn't work. Okay. And so you can't trust that you can't trust that router. You can't trust the DNS it points you to either. And and so the only thing you can do is trust a little bit, throw away the code, and then try and tunnel your way out until you can find a DNS sec type DNS, and then build a VPN to some way that you know will deliver your packets to the internet with fidelity. That's the only thing you can do. Okay. But every one of our devices today does exactly the opposite. It arbitrarily trusts the infrastructure. So we're really your so you have to solve that problem. Then you've got to bring it up a little and solve this identity and access management and all the world problem, right? Which involves crypto and multiple identities. And I think everybody needs to accept that a functioning democracy needs multiple identities, including an anonymous identity. Freedom of the press is founded on that whole notion that an anonymous identity is fundamental to the way we structure our society, because that's how information needs to get out sometimes. So Google has failed at this, Facebook has failed at it, everybody's failed at it because they try and force this notion of a single identity and a single username and password. Okay? And so they're all screwing it up right now, by me. It's a very hard problem. Now, with a bit of crypto, you can do this, and hardware, again, again can help. Unfortunately, the, the tools to manage hardware embedded passwords and so on are just not present at the moment. And uh, so there's a lot of work to do. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, a question about, uh, I know it's a bit different than that, but you're, you're aware of the stuff being by the trusted computing group. Yeah, they're approached by putting encryption on storage devices, things like that. Yeah, how does that tie into some of the uh, concepts? Well, I think everything has to be encrypted at risk. That's, that's a no-brainer. Um, you know, the problem that we have had, the, the, we're very good at doing signaling protocols in the world, right? We have SS7, phone calls, SIP, and blah, blah, blah. There isn't one, there is no good way of managing key distribution. That is a huge vulnerability in our infrastructure. It's very hard, it's very hard to do securely, and we always screw it up. And this is why we always end up in this horrible position of using you know, RSO style tokens, you've got a man in the middle attack opportunity and, uh, and forcing username password type thing. Um, so, you know, there's a big, big software problem to solve, it's key distribution. Or whatever the 
material that way. That, so my key appeal is, this is not hard stuff to do. It's 100,000 lines of code. It's all in open source. It's all there. You can go and do it now, and it runs Amazon Web Services. So everybody should do this, and we would, you know, whatever the billions of dollars that result from this type of support, we can get rid of instantly. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much for the interesting discussion. Thanks very much. Thank you.